And now introducing Mr. Keith Lanton. Good morning, it's Keith. Hope everybody had a uh, good weekend, uh, perhaps some Halloween events. Uh, happy Halloween to, uh, to all here on uh, Monday, October 31st, the last uh, day of October, which uh, is significant because it is the fiscal year end for uh, some institutional investors. So we might uh, see some final repositioning as the month ends and uh, may see increased volatility as, uh, as uh, November begins and lots of uh, market moving uh, potential news uh, coming up this week. Um, after a uh, week last week where we uh, saw uh, the rally that uh, had started a couple of weeks back uh, continue in, uh, in equities and also uh, in the Treasury market. This morning, we're going to uh, continue uh, our uh, discussion on well-respected investors and their philosophies on investing. And uh, then we'll talk about how that might play into uh, what's taken place in the markets, uh, you know, long term, uh, thinking about uh, positioning portfolios for the next one, three, five, and ten years based on each of our individual circumstances, and how having this uh, long term perspective is uh, critically important. It's really the main differentiator between individual investors and long term investors, and it's really the biggest advantage that individual investors have is that they can play the long game and be able to stay invested over long periods of time. And uh, the real key is to avoid uh, making mistakes uh, based on emotional decisions. We'll talk about the upcoming elections, which are next Tuesday, November 8th, uh, Fed meeting this week. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the expectations for what the Fed may or may not do and what may influence those, uh, those decisions and what the markets uh, may or may not be anticipating. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the potential different outcomes of the election and what that uh, may mean for uh, financial markets. Um, and uh, we'll talk about uh, income investments as interest rates uh, have increased uh, dramatically. Uh, think about it. We started the year at about 25 basis points, and the probability is we'll be at about 4% uh, uh, by uh, Wednesday of this week. Uh, that is a dramatic uh, multi uh, multi, multiple uh, level increase in interest rates, uh, going from uh, 0.25 to uh, 4, you know, 15, 16 times move in interest rates. So it's not surprising that we're seeing dramatic volatility. Um, the scale of the rate increase is uh, unprecedented. Uh, so opportunities and in income, dividend paying stocks, uh, Barron's uh, really banging the uh, table on uh, municipal bonds as well. And, uh, then if we have time, talk a little bit about one of the uh, darlings that's fallen from grace, uh, Meta. Uh, Barron's uh, discussed the uh, different scenarios on uh, on their view on uh, uh, potential uh, future um, and whether or not Meta represents uh, an opportunity or continues uh, to uh, to be a, a, a trap for investors. And then, of course, we'll turn it over to Brad and uh, get further uh, Thoughts and uh, insights uh, from him um, on the markets, uh, especially uh, the bond markets. Uh, so this morning, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, an investor. Um, last week, we talked about Warren Buffett. Um, this investor, um, not as well-known to retail investors, certainly extremely well-known uh, institutionally, extremely well-respected, uh, Howard Marks, and uh, his views on investing. Um, one of uh, his main tenants uh, that he always, uh, you know, tries to uh, use as a uh, as a touchstone is that everything in our environment is in flux and is changing, and we can't expect to control our environment. Therefore, we, as investors or as uh, as 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 stewards of our own ship in life, we have to accommodate to our environment. We have to expect and go with change. And in this world that we're in today, as uh, we uh, pretty much all know, uh, things are changing at an even more rapid pace than they were before, and things were always changing. Uh, really, what's changed is, is how fast that change is taking place. Nothing is the same anymore, and for people whose life, and for people whose uh, life approach is based on sameness, that uh, can be extremely upsetting. When thinking about uh, investments, most people make their investment decisions, and for that matter, their life decisions, on the basis of an unreliable hodgepodge of half-baked logic, 
biases, hunches, emotion, and vague fantasies or fears about the future. There are two types of forecasters um, when people uh, and experts, for that matter, are thinking about uh, the future. Those who don't know and those who don't know, they don't know. What Mark says you have to do is you have to move the expected value of the probabilities in your favor. There is no such thing as, uh, as, as an asset class or an investment class that's untouchable. He says that the single most important thing to think about when investing is, are you buying something cheap? Are you buying something at a good value? That is the most reliable route to investment riches. And the greatest risk you face as an investor is overpaying, even if you're overpaying for a fantastic company or a fantastic building or a fantastic asset price. The essential question about any investment should be, is it cheap? When thinking about overall markets, thinking about uh, the, the general direction, if you're thinking about uh, indexes uh, and putting money into indexes and not looking at an individual asset, you have to think about how much optimism is based into this thesis on this financial market at this uh, moment in time. And when you think about all that, you have to still stay very humble um, and here is the advantage of the individual investor. Perhaps uh, the timing aspect uh, is not the right approach uh, for you as an individual. Um, in fact, uh, Howard Marks uh, says to avoid the idea of trying to time the market. Uh, the timing of the market is, is, is when you are making the investment. It's not once you have already invested. Once you're invested, there is the impossibility of repeatedly predicting the right moment to jump in or out of the market. Um, he has noted in some of his memos that the average annual return on stocks from 1926 to 1987 was 9.4%. But if you had gone to cash and missed 50 of the top 744 months, you would have missed all of the returns. And he says, this tells me that attempts at market timing are a source of risk, not a source of protection. In the investment business, it's very hard to do the right thing. And it's almost impossible, or he would argue it is impossible, to do the right thing at the right time. What he does say is, is the future is unpredictable. But recurring processes, perhaps one that we're experiencing right now, of booms and busts are remarkably predictable. And once we recognize the underlying pattern, we're no longer flying but blind. The problem is most investors act as if the latest market trend will continue indefinitely. So you can't know the future, but it helps to know the past. And when thinking about staying out of the game or thinking that you know better if, in terms of not investing at all, um, he, would, uh, he, would, he would suggest uh, that when taken too far, risk avoidance condemns you to return avoidance. When thinking about overall holistic life approach, and how finances or, or, or the amount of money that you have comes into uh, you know, your philosophy on life. He says financial independence doesn't come from making or having a lot of money. You know what it comes from? He says spending less than you make and living within your means. What you accomplish in life is not the only important thing. It's also how you do it. So moving on to uh, this morning. And uh, taking a look at, uh, at where we are here uh, as we approach November 1st, uh, we are uh, seeing Dow futures down about 160 points, NASDAQ futures uh, down about 70, S&P futures down about 20. Um, and uh, this is as uh, markets uh, digesting some of the big rally that we had in uh, October um, and uh, perhaps some uh, profit taking at, uh, at month end that we're seeing uh, this morning. We're also digesting worse than expected economic data from the Eurozone, which saw the CPI in Europe hit an all-time high in October of 10.7% year over year. Also, China's manufacturing PMI for October fell to its lowest level since July, slipping back into contraction with a reading below 50. It came in at 49.2. New COVID cases in parts of China are prompting new lockdown measures. Disney's Shanghai theme park suspended operations on Monday, according to CNBC. And iPhone production could reportedly be due, could be at risk due to COVID cases at the Foxconn manufacturing facility. 
Treasury yields are entering higher this morning. Ten-year yield is uh, up uh, five basis points to 405. Two-year note is up six basis points to 4.48. Economic data today is limited to the uh, Chicago PMI reading. Um, looking for that to come in around 46, um, and that number comes out at uh, 9.45 uh, a.m. Eastern Time. So what do we have going on this week? Um, we have the Federal Reserve meeting on Wednesday. Uh, current expectations show that uh, 84% of the futures market sees another 75 basis point increase at the meeting. Um, expectations for the following meeting uh, in December, which is really what the markets are focused on uh, because they expect a 75 basis point increase at this meeting, uh, are now leaning towards uh, that we will see a 50 basis point hike at the December meeting instead of 75. But uh, that is really the uh, question the market's really trying to uh, answer as the probability of the uh, December hike is at 50, is at 75, is, uh, has been uh, waffling back and forth now for uh, several uh, weeks. Uh, individual companies in the news, uh, Apple, um, because of that uh, potential shutdown at Foxconn, uh, where they produce about 30% of uh, their iPhones, um, could have a significant impact on the company if there is a shutdown at the Foxconn facility. Uh, Credit Suisse uh, in the news uh, again. Um, reporting from Bloomberg that uh, they could be looking towards 20 banks for a, a capital increase. Uh, Caterpillar this morning downgraded UBS to neutral from buy. Uh, Emerson EMR uh, reported earnings. They beat by 14 cents. They reported revenues in line. Uh, they guided their first quarter of next year above consensus and uh, next year's earnings above consensus and also announced they will sell a majority stake in their climate uh, technologies unit to Blackstone in a transaction valuing, valuing that unit at uh, $14 billion. In Asia, markets uh, began the week mostly on a higher note. Uh, the Nikkei was up 1.8%. Uh, India was up north of 1%. Uh, South Korea up 1%. Australia up a little over 1%. Uh, the one market uh, that was uh, in the red was the Chinese market, the Shanghai down 8 tenths of 1%, and the Hang Seng was down 1.2% in Hong Kong. European markets uh, relatively uh, flat this morning. Um, taking a look at the uh, news this morning, um, looks like in the uh, Brazilian election that uh, leftist leader uh, Lula da Silva has uh, won the election um, in Brazil, according to the New York Times, against uh, uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, last I saw, uh, Bolsonaro had not conceded defeat. Uh, he was uh, questioning the integrity of the election before the election. Bloomberg reporting that Goldman Sachs uh, saying that they expect the Fed funds rate to reach 5% in March of next year. Financial Times reporting that Republicans hold the polling advantage in the final days of the midterm election campaign. Times saying that Republicans will try to roll back corporate tax increases, climate change spending, student loan forgiveness, and IRS expansion if they retake Congress. Um, reports over the weekend that Russia will suspend the grain export deal with Ukraine. There are reports that ships are still leaving Ukraine despite the uh, uh, Russia's exit, uh, but uh, time will uh, indicate whether or not uh, those uh, shipments continue. Uh, Reuters reporting that Macau has reinstated some uh, coronavirus uh, restrictions um, for the uh, gambling uh, Mecca uh, uh, Chinese uh, island there at Macau. Moving on to uh, Barron's. Uh, taking a look at, uh, at the Federal Reserve, which uh, is meeting this week, uh, Meeting starts uh, on Tuesday, tomorrow, November 1st, and lasts uh, until Tuesday, until Wednesday, November 2nd, at which point uh, there'll be a decision on the uh, interest rates and Fed funds. Uh, Fed funds. Um, and uh, Chairman Powell will also be holding a uh, news conference that will be uh, carefully watched and uh, many uh, uh, listening with bated breath to his uh, every word. So... As I mentioned earlier, it's expected that the Fed will raise uh, their key target rate uh, by 75 basis points from three to three and a quarter to uh, uh, three and three quarters to four percent. The hike would be the fourth consecutive one of that size, putting the central bank on its steepest rate increase path since the early 1980s. Uh, median expectation now is for a terminal rate or a uh, top Fed funds rate of 4.4 percent. I mentioned a few minutes ago that Goldman Sachs. Uh, is expecting that to 
uh, be higher at 5%. Yet across an array of markets, from credit to currencies to equities, financial conditions eased meaningfully last week. Uh, do the markets know something that everybody doesn't, or is what they think they know wrong? Uh, according to the CME FedWatch uh, site, Fed Funds futures are placing an 81% probability of a 75% increase uh, at the at this meeting. Um, futures markets also has been pointing to lower future boosts. Um, I mentioned earlier the uh, 50 basis point rate hike in December is now a stronger bet than the 75 basis point uh, move. The shift in expectations has rippled across the markets. In particular, Treasury yields have dropped markedly, even after an uptick on Friday and uptick again this morning. Uh, benchmark uh, yield uh, last week briefly slipped below 4% um, from north of 4 and a quarter percent at the beginning of last week. Uh, perhaps more importantly, real or inflation-adjusted yields on the 10-year uh, Treasury Inflation Protected Security uh, posted about a 25% point decline as well, indicating that inflation expectations uh, dropped marketedly. Um, also, uh, some would argue positive news is that uh, the dollar um, also lost altitude last week, uh, down almost 3%. Uh, continued reversal of the dollar would be a positive for uh, U.S. corporate profits, uh, which have been uh, under pressure uh, due to the strong dollar, and we've seen that in uh, many uh, uh, analyst calls with uh, with Fortune 500 companies citing the strong dollar as a big drag or headwind for them um, for their earnings. Um, last week, um, we saw a continuation of a trend that's been going on uh, for several months now. The Dow uh, continuing to uh, outpace the Nasdaq, uh, something that uh, has, that we uh, haven't seen uh, happen all that often in the last decade or so. Uh, Barron saying the Dow is having a great month. The Nasdaq is having a good one. Uh, Nasdaq last week was up 2.8%, um, and it is on pace to lag behind the Dow in October by the most in any one month since 2002. And Barron suggests that uh, uh, the Dow could continue to outpace uh, the Nasdaq for the foreseeable future. Uh, there's no denying the stock market had a good week. The Dow uh, gained 5 Point seven percent. S and P was up four uh, percent, and I mentioned uh, Nasdaq up uh, about two and a half percent for October. The Dow has jumped fourteen point four percent. It's on pace for its best month since January of nineteen seventy six, when the Dow gained fourteen point four percent. When you look at other indices, uh, you'll see the Dow uh, up fourteen is the leader. The Russell is two thousand is up about eleven. The S and P is up eight point eight. And the NASDAQ has gained uh, a paltry 5%. The kind of outperformance by the Dow against the NASDAQ doesn't happen very often. Uh, the Dow has outperformed the NASDAQ by more than 9 percentage points this month. That's the most since February of 2002. Um, and the seventh largest monthly gap in 45 years. Uh, you can blame the NASDAQ's underperformance on some of its biggest stocks. Uh, past week saw big drops in stocks like Meta, uh, Alphabet, Amazon, and uh, to a lesser extent, Microsoft. Um, of the uh, of the uh, big mega cap stocks, uh, the only one to uh, buck the trend recently, and uh, particularly last week, was Apple. Um, this really is the first time in 20 years that investors in technology have had their assumptions of effortless outperformance uh, challenged uh, to this degree. Taking a look at the elections, which uh, certainly uh, uh, will have a strong influence on the economy and therefore uh, markets. Um, Barron's uh, says that there are three potential outcomes for the midterms and uh, takes a look at what each scenario uh, would mean for the markets. So the November 8th midterm will decide whether the Democrats or Republicans uh, uh, control uh, Congress and whether or not uh, one party or the other controls uh, one party or, or one, 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 hat, one chamber or both chambers. Uh, much is riding on that outcome from tax policy to defense spending to the likelihood of a debt ceiling fight. If the GOP takes either the House or the Senate, expect no new taxes and no inflationary fiscal spending over the next two years. If Democrats retain control, the focus will be pa on passing social spending legislation and potentially raising taxes to pay for it. A divided Washington could find room for compromise on the farm bill and industrial policy. Uh, but the need to raise the debt ceiling could spark a political brawl. 
If you're looking at uh, the elections and wondering what uh, the outcome of the elections may mean uh, for financial markets, um, well, just the fact that there are midterms and how markets react going into midterms and how they react going out of midterms could be studied. Um, since 1962, uh, the S&P has underperformed uh, the 12 months ahead of the midterms and outperformed in the 12 months after the midterms. Um, based on the monthly data, going back to 1962, uh, for the 12 months prior to midterms, the market's down 1.1%, and uh, markets uh, have enjoyed a 16% uh, the year following uh, elections. Uh, Barron's uh, is uh, cautiously uh, optimistic, but is not expecting a dramatic outperformance, uh, citing the fact that uh, this time we still have a Federal Reserve that uh, is raising interest rates. Uh, we don't uh, see on the horizon yet uh, a scenario where the Fed will start cutting rates. Um, at the same time, we still have uh, negative real rates, uh, which uh, they cite is one of the biggest uh, concerns. If you're uh, super optimistic uh, going forward, you want to see those, those real rates uh, come into positive territory. So if the, if the uh, Federal Reserve this week is going to be raising uh, the Fed funds rate to 4%. If inflation is still running here in the U.S. at 6 or 7%, that means we still have negative rates. Um, so the expectation is we'll be at 4% uh, at the end of uh, this week. Um, by the end of the year, we could be at 4.5%. Uh, um, if uh, you're following Goldman Sachs, then, well, in March, you could be at 5%. And then I guess the critical question is, what is inflation running at at that point? And have we finally gotten to positive uh, real interest rates? Um, at that point, uh, policy is truly starting to become restrictive, and then you could argue that uh, at that point, the Federal Reserve, um, if things are slowing down, might cut interest rates. Um, but uh, the economist in me says the Federal Reserve will be very hesitant to cut interest rates until you see negative, uh, until you see positive real rates, um, until you see um, the Fed funds rate exceeding the inflation rate, uh, the Fed's going to be uh, very hesitant. Some other thoughts on uh, markets uh, coming from Barron's. Uh, Barron's suggests uh, taking a look at companies that are going to benefit from reshoring, uh, bringing business back uh, here to the United States, and to also uh, be mindful and concerned about companies that might uh, be harmed uh, by reshoring because the Chinese uh, may retaliate against some industries uh, that uh, are having success uh, within China. So regardless of Republicans uh, do regain uh, control of one or two chambers of Congress. Uh, the expectation is that the U.S. will continue to uh, have a policy where the U.S. is very cautious about uh, relying on China and doing business with, uh, with China on multi-levels. Um, in fact, some are calling uh, for U.S. policy is to look like a zero China world policy, and that could have uh, major repercussions. So the Chinese may be starting to think to themselves, well, the U.S. is now starting to think about uh, blocking, uh, sending us uh, high-level or, or advanced chips. Um, what are some other products that the Chinese buy from us that uh, they would be concerned about uh, the U.S. blocking? And one that comes to mind are aircraft. Uh, U.S. sells uh, and Boeing sell lots of uh, planes to the Chinese. Um, Chinese may be concerned that if uh, the U.S. Uh, were to uh, invoke uh, policies going forward, uh, may be difficult for them to get parts for those Boeing planes, and perhaps uh, they should uh, think about uh, competitors like Airbus. Um, alternatively, uh, the Chinese use lots of uh, U.S. Uh, equipment from uh, Caterpillar uh, to uh, to do mining and building. And uh, if uh, the U.S. Uh, makes it difficult for the Chinese for potentially one day to get replacement parts for those. Uh, the, that, that earth moving equipment, perhaps they would uh, look at uh, competitors in uh, Korea or, uh, or, or Europe um, as opposed to the U.S. So that's one area to be uh, focused on is uh, which companies do a lot of business in China and where might China start saying, hey, uh, there's a risk to us. On the flip side, uh, the U.S. Uh, has uh, industries that we want to bring back or reshore here. Um, who will be the potential beneficiaries of, uh, of those companies coming uh, back into the United States and producing more here? Um, well, the expectation is uh, big uh, electronic uh, industrial companies like Honeywell, H-O-N, uh, would be potentially a beneficiary. Um, 
defense company like uh, Raytheon, another electronic company like Roper Technologies, ROP, uh, companies that help these companies uh, build out the infrastructure like United Rentals, URI, um, and uh, real estate uh, companies that help these companies with logistics like Prologis, PLD, could be beneficiaries. Um, Sotchen even goes as far as saying that the small companies will be beneficiaries uh, because they tend to do business in the U.S. and support U.S. businesses. And perhaps a way to uh, participate in that would be by uh, investing in Paychex, the payroll company, P-A-Y-X, because they have a focus on uh, the payrolls uh, for smaller uh, U.S. companies. So we talked about rising interest rates, and we talked about uh, the pitfalls that uh, may or may not come from uh, increasing interest rates going forward. Um, and now we could talk about the opportunities that higher interest rates uh, may afford us as investors. Uh, one place we can look is dividend-paying stocks. Um, they can help us battle inflation and uh, help us uh, get an income while we're waiting for stocks to recover. Dividend-paying stocks have been relative winners this year. Uh, Dividend-paying shares in the S&P 500 are down 11%, including dividends. That compares with a decline of 19% for the S&P 500 and 23% decline for non-dividend-paying stocks. Um, another place to look would be bonds. Um, of course, uh, bonds have uh, declined significantly this year. The Bloomberg U.S. Aggregate Bond Index is off 16%. It's worst performance going back to 1988. But an area of the bond market, Barron's, uh, suggests uh, investigating seriously and one that uh, we've been talking about for uh, several months and Brad's been uh, uh, sharing with us uh, for the last uh, uh, many weeks is municipal bonds. Uh, Barron saying it's time to scoop up muni bonds. They offer yields you don't want to miss. A historic route in the bond market this year has resulted in the highest yields on municipal bonds in 15 years. And Barron's goes on to say it looks like an excellent buying opportunity. By m at midweek last week, the muni market uh, was down 13% for the year. It's worst showing in 40 years. Um, but the silver lining is the yield has jumped to 4.2% from 1.1% for long-term uh, munis. Um, the average long-term municipal bond is down 15 to 20%. Um, and uh, although uh, many investors uh, are licking their wounds, um, there are now uh, arguably uh, lots of opportunities uh, to uh, invest uh, surplus cash at uh, significantly higher rates and yields uh, for individual investors and to enjoy tax-free income. So if you're looking at uh, a yield of uh, 4% and you are in a 50% tax bracket, you're looking at an aft, uh, a, a, a pre-tax yield of 8%. In other words, if you earned 8%, you had to pay 50% tax on that, you'd wind up with the 4% that you're netting in a uh, municipal bond. And that 50% tax bracket takes into account for the highest uh, uh, tax bracket for investors. If you happen to be in a 37% tax bracket, you happen to be in a high tax state like New York or California, and you happen to be in a location that also uh, has a, uh, a city tax like uh, like New York City. So for those investors who live in those locales, uh, municipals are looking uh, even more attractive uh, than uh, for folks uh, who are living in lower tax jurisdictions. And in those instances, uh, municipals still remain attractive. Historically, municipals have bounced back in a big way in years following large losses. Uh, even better, the high yields right now aren't a sign of financial distress. State and local governments are flush with tax revenue. Credit rating upgrades uh, have exceeded downgrades by a 3 to 1 margin this year. Uh, Dave Hammer, the head of PIMCO's Muni Bond Group, says the combination of higher yields and improving credit quality has made Muni Bonds very attractive. Why have yields shot up so high? Why are municipal bonds yielding more than treasuries? Uh, because individual investors uh, are concerned and nervous and have pulled almost $100 billion um, out of uh, municipal bonds and municipal bond funds. Uh, the municipal bond market is not a market of deep liquidity. Uh, so when you see outflows of this magnitude, uh, the, bid, the bid side of the market or the people willing to buy, uh, that side of the market uh, dissipates or disappears and uh, the prices drop and the yields go up, and it presents opportunities like the one that we're seeing now. I'm going to turn it over to Brad, uh, give us some more thoughts and insights this morning. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Keith. Good morning, everyone. 
up. I hope everyone had a nice, peaceful weekend, and those in the Northeast got to go outside, stop looking at screens, and enjoy the beautiful uh, weather and foliage. Uh, I'm going to be a little brief today, uh, not because of lack of things to discuss. I could probably speak for hours, uh, but primarily that because of that Barron's uh, bullish article on municipals, I want to see how the market is reacting. So far, we're off to a slow start. I don't see any real repricing uh, based on that article yet, uh, and I wouldn't expect that because that's an article that's uh, really geared towards retail. Uh, institutions who are crossover buyers may read that article, and they will bring it into the war rooms and determine whether it is time to be a cross crossover buyer into uh, municipal bonds. Uh, there are many other issues that are also affecting uh, the municipal market. Uh, treasury rates, tax loss selling, as well as illiquidity uh, still control the trend. Uh, but as we do head into the ninth inning of 2022, it's really time to review your portfolios and fixed income. See what your maturity structure is. After this tremendous rate move, uh, it is possible that you may want to extend your maturities and lock in some better rates. And when I say maturities, look at the call dates also, because you don't want to get higher coupons with very short call dates if the goal is to um, to have them last maturity. Uh, if the call dates do not matter if you're looking at a lower coupon bond, if you're looking at a, two, a really distressed 2 or 3% coupon bond that's trading in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, the call the the call date is going to be of less uh, importance. Uh, also, please take a look to see if you have losses that you can harvest for either now or the future, uh, as well as reset your cost basis on uh, the bonds that you own in your portfolio. Uh, there are a lot of other things to discuss. I obviously still do like municipals here as well. Uh, the potential roadblocks, as I had mentioned, are a very hawkish Fed, continued illiquidity, and continued deleveraging of municipal funds. And if we head into recession down the road because the uh, Fed does not take uh, the, the foot off of the pedal, uh, we could that could be a potential drag on credit, which we've seen after situations uh, where there have been uh, severe rate hikes. In sports betting lingo, though, if that scenario is the over, I would most likely bet on the under. Uh, I do think that the municipals are a good buy here. I do think it probably will work out, but I do have to give you all the caveats of why it could not work out. Uh, but as a betting person, I would say that the municipals have a better shot of working out than not. Back to Keith. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. That's everything I've got. Thank you for listening to Mr. Keith Lantern. This podcast is available on most platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Pandora. For more information, please visit our website at www.heraldlantern.com. Opinions expressed herein are subject to change and not necessarily the opinion of the firm. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. The information presented herein is for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide personal investment advice. It is important that you consider your tolerance for risk and investment goals when making investment decisions. Investing in securities does involve risk and the potential of losing money. The material does not constitute research, investment advice, or trade recommendations.